Last weekend was our 10-year anniversary, and I uh, want to thank everyone for being a part of that. Someone asked me, uh, you know, why, why do we celebrate anniversaries? And, you know, it's not like a, a wedding, I guess. But if you read through the Old Testament, the nation of Israel would celebrate things that God actually called them to remember, you know, to be reminded of his blessings, uh, not just to dwell on the past, but also to consider how that would propel them to continue to move forward. And so really, uh, an anniversary is an opportunity to remember what God has done and to also remember that he has called us to press on. Uh, we're not here to just rest on laurels, but we are wanting to continue to build on what God has been doing. I do want to reiterate the importance of baptism and membership. You know, it's something that whether you yourself or maybe someone you know uh, needs to hear. Uh, if you are a Christian and have not yet been baptized, if you know someone who is a Christian and has not yet been baptized, uh, it's just it's not just a matter of um, something you do. Uh, it's really an issue of obedience that comes out of a love for Christ. Uh, we want to get baptized because we want to confess that we love Christ. Uh, it's not something that you have to wait to be ready to do. Uh, the early church of Aretha, the book of Acts, it really was upon uh, their confession of faith right away. And it was not a small thing. It was actually a life-changing decision because for many, it meant that they were going to be rejected, uh, especially the early, early church being made up of Jews. Uh, for them to follow Christ meant most likely that their family and friends would disown them. And so that public proclamation was kind of a big deal. But really, what really was behind it was because they love Christ. And as Annie mentioned, that's part of the Great Commission. We note that in making disciples, there's the going, there's the baptizing, and then there's the teaching. And that baptizing is part of that process of becoming a disciple. And so, baptism only makes sense if you are a believer. You know, that's why getting baptized as a baby uh, it's not actually a baptism. Uh, it's representative of a tradition, especially within uh, Presbyterian churches and other denominations that do want to celebrate that babies are part of the covenant people. Uh, but that itself doesn't represent what baptism is about according to Scripture. And membership as well, you know, that's something that we want to encourage anyone who has not been a member, and if you know someone who has been coming in is not a member, it's something that, it's not just a formality, it really is an expression of your commitment to loving Christ and his body. It's saying that I'm going to be committed to this body, and I'm going to fulfill the things that the scriptures call me to do, and I want that accountability. And we all need that accountability. Uh, none of us can survive uh, like an island as a Christian. And so I want to encourage any of you who are not yet a member, and going to the membership class doesn't um, obligate you, but it does inform you. Uh, it gives us a chance. Andy and myself will spend uh, pretty much a whole day sharing about what the church is about. We'll have some food together too, because that's always important. Uh, but that would be something I hope that those who are not yet members would consider. Well, as we go back to First Thessalonians, and again, just want to thank uh, Andy for getting us through the book of Daniel, getting us through some challenging uh, portions, especially in terms of the end times. And we're going to talk a little bit about that at the end of First Thessalonians 2, because there's uh, portion regarding the end times there. But as we start off chapter 2, I just want to give kind of a brief reminder that when Paul wrote to the Thessalonian church, it was really centered around this theme of the gospel. In verse 5, he says that 
the message they brought was not in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full assurance. And as he reflected on that short period of time, remember he was only there for maybe a few months in Thessalonica. Paul says he remembers their work of faith, their labor of love and steadfastness of hope. And when he shares that, he's reflecting on how the gospel of Christ had transformed the members of this church in a very short time. In fact, they had become dear to his heart. Paul gave thanks to God, always making mention of them in his prayers. And and we talked about that when we first went through chapter 1 to say, you know, is that something that we practice when we think about our heart for the church? The Thessalonian church received the ministry of the word with much affliction. You know, and that's a telling sign uh, of a church that doesn't just receive the truth of Scripture in a comfortable way, but what do you do when there's affliction that comes along with it? It was received with much joy in the Holy Spirit. You see, their testimony was one that they had turned to God from idols. They were now serving the living and true God, and they were waiting for the risen Christ from heaven who would come to rescue them from the wrath to come. Now, if you remember, Thessalonica was really in many ways a model church. They were exemplary. In fact, they had become imitators of Paul, Silas, and Timothy, but really they were imitators of Christ. And in turn, they became models for others to imitate. Now, today we want to talk about what does it mean to be entrusted with the ministry of the gospel? Because that's what happened. Paul brought the ministry of the gospel, and he was entrusted with that. And so in turn, they were entrusted with the ministry of the gospel. In fact, they were already fulfilling the great commission of Christ. They were making disciples. They were continuing the ministry of the gospel. So let me ask you a question. I don't know if you've actually thought about this yourself. What does it mean to be entrusted with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Is it only for pastors or missionaries or evangelists? In fact, when you hear the word ministry, is that only for a select few in the church? Or is it actually for every Christian? Now, we don't want to deny that there are different roles. There is even a calling for those who would be in pastoral ministry. We recognize that. There are those who have the particular gifts of preaching and teaching. But there might be some of you who think when you hear the word ministry that maybe there is something about it that's only meant for certain people, like for the people up front or the people who have some sort of communicating ministry. And maybe the only part that you might have is that you are to direct someone who is doing the ministry of the gospel. Now, we we look at the book of Acts and we read through the New Testament, and especially in the life of Paul, we might think, well, Paul definitely had the ministry of the gospel, right? It seems very clear, at least he did. But does that mean I do as well? Like, am I supposed to be like Paul? Now, we need to recognize Paul did have a unique and distinct calling, and we're not all called to be exactly like Paul in what he did. But are we called to be ministers of the gospel? I think what limits many churches, and this really comes from the enemy, and this really cripples congregations, it's to think that somehow ministry is only meant for a select few, and everyone else is there to receive the ministry of those people. But for Paul, it's not that way. But what we can do is look at his life and see that there are principles that we can follow. 
that we can imitate, and that is we are to be ministers of the gospel because we've been entrusted with the gospel. So first point, being entrusted with the gospel. The term gospel, Paul uses this word 65 times in his epistles. It is by far the core message of his writings. Each of his letters discuss explicitly the the word gospel, except for Titus. But even Titus, while he doesn't use the explicit word for gospel, he describes the gospel clearly. And here are some things that really set the groundwork in understanding the ministry of the gospel. God is the one who does the entrusting. God is the one who approves the ministry of the gospel. God is also the one who is the witness of how we minister the gospel. And this might seem obvious, but the gospel is really God's gospel. It's not something that we came up with our own. It's not something that we ourselves made up. God is the one who gives the message of the gospel, and he gives the ministry of the gospel. In 1 Thessalonians 2, starting in verse 1, it says, For you yourselves know, brothers, that our entrance to you was not in vain, but after we had already suffered and been mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much struggle. Then you jump down to verse 4, it says, But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. Now, if you remember when Paul and his company went to Thessalonica, they spoke the gospel. In fact, they had much boldness to speak the gospel. But this was not easy. It was amid much struggle. But how was it that they had this boldness? It was because Paul understood that he and the others had been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. That's why they could speak. In fact, we have to remember the gospel message never starts with us, but with God. God does the approving. God does the entrusting. In fact, we have no authority on our own to speak the gospel. In fact, we have no capacity to speak the gospel on our own, apart from God being the one who entrusts us with the gospel. Now, something that we might have to take some time to ponder is do we consider this entrusting of the gospel precious? We might hear the word entrust and say, I've been given a responsibility, and it is. We might even think oh, it's, it's my obligation, I suppose, because I have to honor God. But do you actually consider it a precious thing? That you would be approved by God, that you would be entrusted with his gospel. What is the word gospel? Well, literally, it means good news. And it's not just any good news. It's the good news of Jesus Christ, who died and rose again for sinners. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ is a unique, distinct, and exclusive claim that no one else can share. It is the good news that Jesus Christ came to save sinners. And who are the sinners? All of us. Now, every single person who was born in this world, except for Christ, was born a sinner. Ever since Adam and Eve introduced sin into this world by their disobedience, everyone who has been born of their lineage inherits the curse of sin. But it's not just the curse of sin that's been passed down. It is the reality of sin in each person's life that confirms what is taught as the doctrine of total depravity. Now, total depravity is not that every person has sinned to the maximum capacity that you are able to. Rather, it means that every part of your person has been corrupted by sin. Our hearts, our minds, our bodies, our souls all have been tainted. In fact, 
every part of who we are is inclined toward rebellion, toward God. You know, one of the things about babies, uh, you know, we got to see JJ yesterday, and uh, I got to hold him. And that was really nice because when Benny was a baby, I didn't get to hold him. I was bedridden at the time. And so it, it's a very precious thing to hold a baby. But what happens to that baby? That baby starts learning to talk and walk and exercise a will of its own. And that's why no parent has ever denied the doctrine of total depravity. Because it's evident, right? I mean, you don't have to teach your children to sin. They are so capable of sinning. And that's because of the sin nature that we all have. But just wait till that child grows up. What happens? You just get more confirmation that they're a cynic. In fact, some parents, after a while, you might think, so why did I have children if all I did was bring sinners into this world? Now, that, that's a dark way to look at it, and I, I'm not encouraging that. Okay? There are also precious gifts from the Lord. The Bible says that. But we're all sinners. In fact, if we don't understand how sinful we are, and not how sinful everybody else is. Everyone's good at that, right? We're good at pointing out every other person's sinfulness, but how about my own? You know, when Paul thought about the gospel, it wasn't just that he was given some sort of job or task, just a message to share. I mean, it was something that he was willing to suffer for. Right? It says that they were suffering and mistreated, that it was amid much struggle that they spoke the message of the gospel. They were willing to suffer physical abuse and public humiliation. That's why Paul says when they were in Philippi, that's what happened. They suffered. And yet he continued, as he got to Thessalonica, to continue to proclaim the message of the gospel. And he suffered in Thessalonica as well. But why? We'll turn to Romans chapter 1. This is one of the classic passages that really starts off the book of Romans. In verse 16, Paul writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous will live by faith. You see, if there's one thing that Paul lived out, it was that he was not ashamed of the gospel. He was not ashamed of this good news. But it wasn't that this good news was popular. It wasn't that it was accepted. In fact, it wasn't that it was even treated as something neutral. People hated the message of the gospel. There was violent opposition. Now, why is it that the gospel elicits sometimes even a violent response I mean, if really it's just a message, I mean, if it's just literally just words, then why do people get angry about it? I remember my father being so angry, even violently angry against the gospel. And, and I don't understand, I didn't understand. Like, why do you have to get angry about it? You could say you disagree. You could say you dismiss it. But why get upset? Well, It's because there's an enemy who is behind this opposition. In fact, there's an enemy who is seeking to blind people to the gospel. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And verses 3 and 4 says this, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Now, we shouldn't be surprised that there's a blindness to the gospel. 
This is not just because it happens to be that way. There's a very active blinding by the God of this age, by the devil, by his demons, to blind the minds of the unbelieving in any way that would keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. I mean, think about this. What, what do we see going in on our world today? There are constant messages really to distract and to keep people blind to the reality that they're perishing. And in their perishing, they're going to face the consequences of their sins. They're going to face the penalty of condemnation, eternal death. If we are to understand the heart of Paul, Silas, and Timothy, and others who are willing to suffer and be mistreated for the sake of the gospel, you'll know that it wasn't just for mere intellectualism. It also wasn't just for some sentimental emotionalism. You know, for those of us who grew up at churches that had youth retreats, and you go to the youth retreat summer, and at the last day there would be a campfire, right? And then uh, they would sing slow songs and uh, try to make you cry, and then you had to throw your pine cone into the fire uh, as if that represented some sort of decision to follow Jesus. That's what we call sentimental emotionalism because people will leave that and nothing will change. We're also not into some religious ritualism. You know, we're not here just to throw out some sort of formulas which you are to somehow adhere to a moralistic code of conduct. Paul had been entrusted with the most important truth in all the world, the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, sometimes when we think about how the church handles the message of the gospel, some would say, well, you know, it's kind of like a, a TED Talk, inspirational. We just want people to kind of be inspired by who Jesus is, and their lives will be better for it. Well, if you think about Paul, before he was saved, he was completely opposed to Jesus Christ. He went out of his way to persecute Christians, to cause them to suffer. He mistreated them. He even murdered them. He was there when Stephen was stoned to death. He affirmed his execution at the hands of the Jewish religious leaders. He even received letters from the chief priests to go to Damascus so that he could go arrest Christians and bring them back to Jerusalem. But then God intervened. He went from being the poster boy for going against Christ to becoming the most significant witness for Christ. He who persecuted became the persecuted. He who had caused others to suffer and be mistreated was now called to a life of suffering and mistreatment. Before he lived for the approval of man, and now he lived for the approval of God. Why? Well, Paul was on a mission for Christ because Christ had entrusted him with something that completely changed his life. Go back to 2 Corinthians 4. And, you know, it, this passage, starting from verse 5 through 11, really describes this whole life mentality that Paul had. 2 Corinthians 4, 5, For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for the sake of Jesus. For God who said, light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be of God and not from ourselves. In every way afflicted but not crushed, perplexed but not despairing, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. 
Notice there in verse 7, it says, We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Paul understood he was the earthen vessel. He was the jar of clay. He, he was the one that was of no consequence. You see, that was not a, a term of value there, to be called a jar of clay or earthen vessel. It's what the vessel contained that mattered. This treasure So going back to 1 Thessalonians 2, when it says that he was entrusted, the word entrusted means to be or become the recipient of something placed into one's care. So something had been placed into his care. What was that something? It was the treasure of the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. See, Paul was in darkness, and then he received the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. You know, if you read Acts 9, and it's the story of Paul. He's called Saul at the time. He's going to Damascus with letters to go arrest those who belong to the way. That's what they were known at that time. If you're a Christian, you belong to the way. He was going to bring them back to Jerusalem. And as he was traveling, it says, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. So literally a light hit him hard. And he asked, who are you, Lord? Now, we don't know all the details here. But somehow, in some way, he knew this light was from somebody. And just maybe he knew immediately that this was not just anybody. When he says, who are you, Lord? The reply was, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. What went on in his heart, do you think, at that moment? I mean, he was filled with hatred, with violence. He was determined to go arrest Christians. And then Jesus himself literally strikes him down, blinds him, and says, go to Damascus. And there he calls and now he is one of the disciples of Christ to go and lay heel to regain his sight. And in Acts 9, 13, uh, Ananias knew full well who Saul was. He says, Lord, I've heard from many about this man how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. You see, Ananias was, he was not naive about this. When God says, go, lay hands on him, he says, well, God, you know, you know who he is, right? I mean, he's the guy that came to arrest Christians. We know about this guy. We know how much harm he did to your saints at Jerusalem. But then it says, the Lord told Ananias, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And from that point on, Paul lived a life of suffering. He had to be let down by a basket over the city wall because people wanted to kill him in Damascus because he started to speak boldly in the name of Jesus. Why did he speak boldly? It was because he had been entrusted with the gospel. He was completely and radically transformed from an enemy of Christ to a fearless witness for Christ. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1, and here you see the testimony of Paul in verse 12. Paul writes, I am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he regarded me faithful, putting me into service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. It is a trustworthy saying and deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost. 
Yet for this reason I was shown mercy, so that in me as the foremost, Christ Jesus might demonstrate all his patience as an example for those who are going to believe upon him for eternal life. Now to the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. I mean, if you follow what Paul's writing there, he understands that he was the chief of sinners. I mean, as far as he was concerned, he was the greatest sinner he knew. But he was shown mercy. He was shown grace. And he was shown mercy so that Jesus might demonstrate all his patience as an example. Ask yourself this. Do you consider your life in the same way? Like, do you think of yourself as the one that Jesus would use to show patience? Or do you actually look at other people and say, well, hey, God, it's really good that you saved that guy because he really needs to be an example of what patience you show to others, as if you didn't need to be shown that patience. When Paul wrote that letter to Timothy, one of the ma- things he makes very clear, and this is in chapter 1, verse 11, is that the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which he had been entrusted, that was the basis for his testimony. Christ had put him into service. He was a blasphemer, a persecutor, a violent aggressor. He did not deserve to be this spokesman. But he was shown superabounding grace. He was given the gift of faith in Jesus. He was given the love of Jesus. And he knew this one truth more than any other truth to be trustworthy, deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And he was the foremost. So going back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, do you understand then why he was so driven to go to Philippi, to suffer, be mistreated, and then continue and go to Thessalonica, where he would be mistreated as well. It was because he was entrusted with something so precious, something so amazing, something so valuable. This is what defined his life. This is what defined his identity, his purpose. It transformed him completely. He no longer was living for himself, but for the one who died and rose again on his behalf. Paul had seen the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Paul had the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ shine out of darkness into his life. Paul had received this treasure. You know, we just sing about that. Greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. And I thought as we are singing that, is he really the greatest treasure? Because it sure looks like for a lot of us, including myself, that we like to pursue other kinds of treasure. And it's the treasure that's from this world. The treasure that passes away. The treasure that Jesus warns us not to lay up. Treasures on earth. You see, this was not just a matter of Paul's vocation I mean, you have to remember this. Paul actually worked to support himself. And he did so that he wouldn't become a burden to others, even though he said as an apostle, he had every right to be supported. And I thought about this. In many ways, you should relate to Paul more than me. You might think, well, you're the pastor. You're paid to do all these things. And hopefully you don't see it just like that. But if you're going to look at what Paul's writing here, and he's saying himself, he worked to support himself as he did ministry. Then how about you? Are you entrusted with the gospel of Jesus Christ? Yes, you are. 
So how does it flesh itself out in your life? You see, for Paul, everything in his life was now centered around this message, the gospel of the glory of Christ. So what have you been doing with what you have been entrusted by Jesus? Do you consider how precious the gospel of the glory of Jesus Christ is to you? Does it humble you like Paul was humbled? I mean, in the light of the gospel, all he could think of was that he was the chief of sinners. I mean, how is it that any of us here could look at anyone else and think somehow I am better? No. The one thought that should really just challenge you is to say it's because of Christ. I understand I am the chief of sinners. You know, the Pharisees and scribes, what were they known for? They were known for pointing the finger at other people, saying, look at you, sinner. Look at you, sinner. Jesus hangs around with sinners. What they really never considered was that they were the chief of sinners. In the end, what they showed was that they did not consider the treasure of the gospel, of the light, of the glory, of the gospel of Jesus. See, Paul was so completely transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ that he was willing to suffer and even die, which he eventually did. He had been entrusted by Jesus with the message of himself. Again, the amazing thing to consider is why would Jesus entrust Paul? Of all people, Paul was the enemy. He was the last person that should have been considered to be entrusted with the gospel. Yet he was shown mercy and grace. But here's an even more amazing question to consider. Why would Jesus entrust you with the gospel? Why would he entrust me? Now, there are other issues involved in the book of First Thessalonians. Uh, for Thessalonians, there are false teachers who infiltrated churches. There are people who are doing ministry for all the wrong reasons. And we'll see this a little later on. But I wanted to really make sure we are we're clear about this. Jesus is the one who has entrusted all of us with the ministry of the gospel. All of us. If you are a Christian, you have been entrusted with the ministry of the gospel. And it is only by his approval that we have been entrusted we have no inherent right of our own to have this ministry. We don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. It is God's gospel. It is his good news. He is the author of this good news, and he has entrusted us to be the vessels through whom the good news is to be proclaimed and carried out. So do you live as one who has been entrusted, or do you squander that trust? Do you waste that trust? And with what? Well, what are we living for? Do we value the gospel in the way which God has determined its value? So my challenge to you today is this. Ask God to humble your heart. To see if you will earnestly desire to take this responsibility of being entrusted with his gospel. The gospel of the glory of Christ and be the kind of witness that testifies of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Through your words and through your actions, we are all called to proclaim the gospel and to live out the gospel. In fact, Acts 1.8, if you remember, is we are to be what? Witnesses. We are all called to be witnesses. And the word witness there is the word where we get the word martyr. Are you willing to live? for Christ, because to live is Christ. Are you willing to die for Christ, because to die is gain? Philippians one twenty one. You see, the treasure of the gospel, and we have to remember this, is not the kind of treasure the world values. In fact, 
the world would like to trample all over the message of the gospel. That's why the world tries so hard to stamp out God's truth. Really, it's an attack against his gospel. That's why the world tries so hard to silence the proclaimers of the good news. Last week, I met a pastor from Pakistan, and he had to be like one of the happiest guys I met. I mean, he was just so happy. He was happy to be in the United States. And uh, he wanted to meet Pastor John MacArthur. He's like, can you, I heard that you, you're close to him. Can you get me an audience with him? And I'm like, uh, I don't know. I don't know if I could. He's like, I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray. Every day I saw him at the conference, he's like, I'm praying. I'm praying. And the last day I had to tell him, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not going to happen. But he came from a country where they kill Christians. And I thought, you know, for us, we're like, yeah, yeah, we hear about stuff like that. Whatever. Not relevant, because I'm not in Pakistan. I'm in L.A. Suffering for us in L.A. is to wait in the in and out line. We think that's suffering, because it's supposed to be fast food, right? It's not fast. It's slow. We think that's hard. Or maybe you do face some hardships. Maybe you face some measure of suffering. But do you consider it in light of the calling to which you have been called? And that gospel is that call, the gospel of Jesus Christ. If there's one thing that you should learn along the way is that this world seeks to dim the light, to diminish the light, to distract people from the light, that's why you have the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life. We as the church are often so distracted by the things that would cause us to stumble in our witness. That's why we need to fix our eyes on Jesus. We need to be reminded of the treasure that he himself is. We need to remember that we've been given this incredible treasure in Christ. We have been saved forever from eternal condemnation to eternal life. We've been saved from the lies of this world. We've been granted the truth from the very author of creation. So we have nothing to fear. So how are we to minister the gospel? I'm just going to go over very briefly It's because it's very straightforward here. How are we to minister the gospel? Now, again, we're not the Apostle Paul. We're not here to replicate everything he did. But his example and testimony gives us much that we can imitate. It's not so much because there's a role involved, it's because there's a treasure involved. We simply do what Jesus himself came to do. In Luke chapter 4, verse 18, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and this is Jesus speaking at synagogue. The Spirit of the Lord upon me, he's quoting from Isaiah, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Jesus brought his gospel. And that's simply the path that Paul followed, to proclaim release to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind. Now only Christ can do that, so that's why we proclaim Christ. You see, if you just follow Paul's life, all he wanted to do was proclaim Christ. Colossians 1.28, Him we proclaim, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. You see, when he wrote these letters to the churches, what he was reminding every believer is this. He was admonishing, teaching with wisdom, so that we would be committed to this ministry of seeing people become complete in Christ. So this is what then gave him boldness. Go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And in verse 2, it says, We had the boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel of God amid much struggle. Now this boldness comes not 
in ourselves, but it is found in God. I mean, you read through other portions of his letters, like in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it wasn't because he had persuasive words of wisdom. It was because of the wisdom of God, because of the power of God. That's what gave him boldness. In Ephesians 6, he says that our strength is in the Lord and in the strength of his might. See, Paul didn't depend on superiority of word or wisdom. He had boldness to proclaim the gospel of the crucified Christ, risen from the dead. Now, how do you know that there's true ministry going on, ministry of the gospel? Verse 2 also says, amid much struggle. We shouldn't be surprised when gospel ministry is accompanied by struggle. And the word struggle there is where we get the word agony. It's the same idea, the base word in Colossians 1.29, when he says that he was striving for the purpose for which he labored to proclaim Christ. There is a struggle. Now, if there's one thing I can validate over all the years is that, yeah, ministry is a struggle. It's a struggle. It's a constant struggle. In fact, there are things that are always going on that you might not know that makes it a struggle. I mean, I could tell you last weekend, you know, it was a highlight in one sense, and uh, I was completely discouraged on the other hand, too, because it was a struggle. It's hard, because the ministry of the gospel is hard. There are things you can't control, and it's because we're in this war. You shouldn't be surprised there's a struggle. True ministry of the gospel is approved by God, verse 4. You know, one of the things that we have to always be reminded of is that we do not seek approval by men. That starts from the get-go. The ministry of the gospel is what has been approved, been approved by God. It is by his entrusting. Verse 4, it also says, For just as we have been approved uh, by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not as pleasing men, but pleasing God who examines our hearts. You know, if there's one thing that we all have to know is that God is the one who examines our hearts. God knows our hearts. We should always be sobered by this reality. Right now, God knows your heart. He knows whether you're here because you love him, because you want to worship him, or if you're here just out of obligation or just for show. Maybe you're trying to prove that you're somehow a reasonable member of Lighthouse, when really that's not what should be driving what you do. You see, it's easy to hide our hearts from people because people can't see our heart motivations. Now, there are some people who like to judge people's hearts. Okay, you're bad. Don't do that, because you don't know people's hearts. I mean, I've heard people actually say, I know your heart. Like, wow, you must be God, because I don't know your heart. I can only guess, but God actually knows our hearts. He examines our hearts. Now, verse 7, and this, this particular verse I want you to really think about. How do you know true ministry of the gospel is taking place? Paul says this, but we proved to be gentle among you as the nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. Now we have some young mothers here. And it's a very vivid word picture. As a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. John MacArthur writes in his commentary, uh, to be gentle, it means to be kind to someone it encompasses a host of other virtues, acceptance, respect, compassion, tolerance of imperfections, patience, tenderheartedness, and loyalty. Now, uh, I, I am not a nursing mother. I am not capable. But I watched my wife as a nursing mother. And there's something very precious about that picture. There, there's this tenderness. 
the word tenderly tears gives this picture of a mother who holds her baby in her arms against her body and literally warms the baby with her own body heat. You see, that's the way Paul saw ministry. That he would show a gentleness and a tender care. Now, you don't show this tenderness and gentleness because it's convenient. Right? Any of you nursing moms, was it easy? As that baby was crying, as that baby squirms, as that baby is not cooperative... Do you think that baby understands all that you have to go through as you're trying to just take care of them? No, the baby doesn't care. But it's your choice. It's a deliberate choice. Despite how tired you are, despite how your body feels, despite how busy you are, you might even have other children you're trying to cook and clean and take care of them. You got a spouse who also needs your support and help. You have a household of responsibilities, and yet you're still called to be tender and gentle? Yes. Now, here's the challenge. Some of us hear this and go, well, I haven't seen any tenderness or gentleness toward me. You missed a point. You're supposed to be the tender and gentle one. You you see, when people refuse to be gentle, What you're actually saying is you're not willing to walk in the Spirit because gentleness is part of the fruit of the Spirit. In fact, gentleness is something that Jesus Christ himself, he characterized himself by it. For I am gentle and humble in heart. Matthew 11. This gentleness is to be shown in the dynamic of the church. How do you know the ministry of the gospel is taking place? It's because gentleness is manifested. This is why when you see a church, and this is especially reflective of leadership, when there's a heavy-handedness, when there's a harshness, when there's a lack of gentleness, that's not gospel ministry. The word tenderness is also used by Paul tenderly caring for his own children. Ephesians 4.32 says, Instead, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, graciously forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. 1 Peter 3.8, Now to sum up all of you, be like-minded, sympathetic, brotherly, tenderhearted, and humble in spirit. How do you know a church is characterized by the gospel of Christ? when there is a ministry that reflects gentleness and tenderness. This is one of the big issues these days in ministry. There there are pastors who are disqualified because of their harshness. But think about that. Anyone can be harsh. Have you been harsh? Have you lacked gentleness? Even in your own household? Tenderness? How about towards your friends? How about towards your fellow church members? The last thing that Paul writes is in verse 8. He says, In this way, having fond affection for you. Fond affection for you. The idea here is showing a strong desire, a persistent desire, a yearning love for, a great affection. In fact, it is a continual yearning that describes this heart attitude. In this way, having fond affection for you. That's an interesting word, affection. How do you show affection? We're not talking about some cheap, touchy-feely thing. We're talking about a genuine care that says, I love you. I have compassion for you. I show affection towards you. In fact, Paul builds on that and says in verse 8, 
we were pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. Why? Because you had become beloved to us. This is an extension of this motherly love. Yes, it's about the gospel. That's why he says that. We were pleased to impart to you the gospel of God, but not only that. You know, you might say, well, yes, I'm willing to give the ministry of the gospel, but you know what? I don't know if I'd be willing to impart my life because I have a life. I'm busy. I got stuff to do with my life. Can you imagine a mother talking that way to their baby? Your baby's born. Your baby has needs. And you say to your baby, hey, baby, you know I got a life. Why should I orient my life around you? You are actually ruining my life. I had plans. I had dreams, and you're the one that's messing it up. Now, I'll take care of you because I have to. It's a whole different thing to say, I will give my life to you. You see, it's not just that a mother shows gentleness or tenderness. It's because a mother gives her life. That's why there's something so incredibly precious about a mother's love. It's this imparting. It's this sharing. Paul says, there we were pleased. One translation would say, we are well pleased. You could say it this way. It's not just that he had to do this. And it's not just that he got to do this. It's that he found great pleasure and satisfaction. It was a delight, a pleasure, a resolve to be content. Why? Because he treated them as beloved. Because you had become beloved to us. You know, some people try to reduce the message of the gospel. This is not a reduction of the gospel. This is how the gospel works in the life of a tree. This is how you know the gospel has really transformed your life. Because you are understanding that you are a minister of the gospel. And that you ultimately love one another. You know, how many times do you think you will get to come on a Sunday to be with God's people? It's a limited number. It's not indefinite. You will only have so many times. Do you hold those as precious? Oh, I know there are days that I'm not too thrilled about going to church either. I mean, if I were to be honest with you, last Sunday was one of those. I didn't want to go to church. I actually prayed that God would strike my back down. Give me a good excuse. Because I know I can't just skip church. That's kind of lame. But God did not answer my prayer, so I had to show up. But I had to also repent of having a horrible attitude. Because it's the same for me. I need to be reminded of how precious it is. Because of Christ. Now, there are ways not to minister the gospel, and Paul makes it clear, not from error, from impurity, or way of deceit, verse 3. Not as pleasing men, verse 4. Not with a flattering word, nor with a pretext for greed, verse 5. Not seeking glory from men. I mean, those things are pretty straightforward. If those are the things that characterize the way you look at the ministry of the gospel, then you are definitely in the role. But this is why it goes back to this understanding of the entrusting of the gospel. You see, that's what kept Paul humble his whole life, even to the end. You see, Paul suffered to the very end. He got no retirement. He got no vacation. He didn't get a sabbatical. All he got was suffering and death. That's how it ended for him. And I think, how is that fair? I mean, of all people... Paul did arguably the most someone could do in being entrusted with the gospel. But you know what I think kept him humble? 
It was that testimony. He knew he was the chief of sinners. He knew he didn't deserve anything. But God showed mercy. God showed grace. God entrusted him with the gospel. You know, when Jesus speaks to him on the road to Damascus, and when Paul says, Who are you, Lord? And Jesus says, I am Jesus. That changed everything for him. Because that's all he lived for. Today's St. Patrick's Day. No, most people, their greatest concern is, uh, are you wearing green? And yes, I'm wearing green. It's right here, just in case. St. Patrick actually was a real person who was a real Christian. And he has this prayer that uh, I've shared before, but I think would be so appropriate to end today. Christ with me, Christ before me. Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ over me, Christ to the right of me, Christ to the left of me, Christ in lying down, Christ in sitting, Christ in rising up. For him, it was simple. Everything was about Christ.